All right, well, thank you. So it's an honor for me to be here. And in fact, this is uh, pretty interesting because uh, that reminds me when I was an undergrad, um, this was at McGill University, and I actually helped to organize a similar seminar series back then. I was asking my professors and, and so on, and then uh, they, they were always happy to, uh, to come and, and give a talk, so I couldn't say no, you know. <laughs> I was uh, very happy to, uh, to come and do this. Uh, and it also reminds me when I was a PhD student here at the University of Toronto, so uh, I walked in this building quite often and many of the surrounding buildings, and then so it's, uh, it's quite nice. Okay, so uh, today I'm, I'm going to talk about some work that was actually done by two undergrad students at the University of Waterloo. Uh, so their names are Vikash Goel and Jamieson Wang. Uh, so I believe they were in second and third year at the University of Waterloo at the time. So uh, what I'm going to be presenting is advanced, but at the same time, you know, should be accessible. Okay, so um, I wear two hats. Um, I am um, a principal researcher at Boyle SAI. And just to give a bit of um, background, so what is Boyle SAI? Uh, so it is um, a research institute. It's funded by Royal Bank of Canada. And then, so we do a research on a number of topics, and that includes machine learning, reinforcement learning, natural language processing, computer vision, uh, fintech, private AI, and, and, and so on. Um, so at World Bank, uh, there's lots of groups that do data science, and then well, I say is essentially the research arm. Um, also, there are five um, research offices. One of them is right here in, in Toronto, just across the street. And, and then, so I'm, I'm actually at the one in Waterloo, but then if some of you are interested, I'm sure that there are ways that uh, we can get you hooked up. Okay, um, so, yeah, so this is what I do half of the time. The other half is I'm, I'm also a professor at the University of Waterloo, and so I've been a professor for 15 years, and um, so I do, I, I work on a number of things, and today it was very tempting to try to give you bits and pieces about all kinds of things, but I figured it's probably better to just talk about one thing, let's go into depth, let's make sure that you know this is something that everyone can understand. So I guess I'll, I'll be talking about the second topic, which is uh, reinforcement learning, and in particular, uh, motion-oriented reinforcement learning that, that I'll explain in, in, in more detail. But I guess I'm, I'm very glad that, um, uh, no, actually, it wasn't you, so, well, whoever, yeah, so, yeah, thank you for giving the introduction earlier in terms of uh, the material. I think this is a, a neat idea. Uh, so often those uh, technical talks can be quite uh, uh, complex. I'll, I'll try to make sure that everything is accessible, but in any case, yeah, feel free to, to ask questions throughout. Um, in any case, after the talk, I'm, I'm happy to discuss any other things related to the topics that I've got on, on the slides here. Okay, so I'm gonna get going. I'll, I'll start by um, uh, doing a bit of um, a broad introduction to where's the field going. Uh, in particular, I'll talk about some speculations of a technological singularity. Then we'll talk about reinforcement learning and then uh, the work that, that we've done on motion-oriented reinforcement learning. Okay, so um, if we go back in 1965, so there's a mathematician, Irvin John Good, uh, so you can see his picture here. Uh, he wrote a very interesting paper. It was called Speculations Concerning the First Ultra-Intelligent Machine. And basically, he was already speculating back in 1965 that AI could lead to uh, some sort of runaway technological growth. And at the time, it just wasn't clear what he was talking about. Today. Um, we have a lot more experience and evidence that technology can indeed um, you know, lead to uh, advances very quickly and, and a lot of people are having trouble to keep up and so on. And, and then this has led to this idea that perhaps we could have some form of singularity. So it was essentially the first one to discuss and, and speculate this idea of singularity. And here it was talking about a technological singularity where really technology just, you know, runs away. Okay, so this idea was then picked up um, several years ago um, by also Ray Kurzweil. So he's a, a futurist at Google, and he wrote a very interesting book in 2005 about the singularity is near. 
And in this case, um, the notion of singularity meant that um, machine intelligence as well as uh, humans would merge. And this was to back up the idea that um, when technology accelerates, a lot of people were saying, well, we're limited and that's going to stop at some point. And, and he was actually speculating that no, technology is not going to be limited by human limits because it's going to merge with humans, it's going to enhance them, and, and then we're going to be able to achieve um, even greater things. So, so in this graph here, what he shows is that um, when we look at technology over time, there's, there's an exponential growth in the sense that you develop one technology, this technology is used to then develop the next technology. So obviously, then we can go faster because we're using the previous technology, but then we can use the latest technology again to develop the next one and so on. And that's how we get the exponential growth. But obviously as humans, we have to be able to cope with that, right? So a lot of people are, you know, always think that, okay, that's gotta end at some point. And, and yeah, his hypothesis was that no, it's not going to end because when we're not gonna be able to cope, the technology is going to help us and we're gonna merge with this technology. It's going to be a symbiosis of machines and, 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 and I guess biology, humans, and, and, and so on. Okay, so in any case, he's been speculating about this for a number of years, since 2005, and it's questionable whether this has arrived or not, but uh, let's keep going. Okay, so where are we today? Um, so when we look at computer science, computer engineering in general, um, what you learn in courses in a bachelor's degree is often um, how to program, right? So the art of programming is quite important. So we want to get a computer to do something. We write a bunch of instructions. These instructions tell the computer what to do. And you take lots of courses just to, you know, gain this art of, of programming. Now, why is that difficult, right? So it's, programming is challenging in part because you have to figure out what is the solution and then spell it out correctly. And most of the time we have some intuitions about the solutions and in many cases we don't even know what the solution is. So then how can we get a computer to do something that we haven't figured out yet, right? So just through programming that would never happen. So we now have a new paradigm with machine learning where the idea is that if we want to get a computer to do something, instead of telling it exactly the steps through programming, we're going to simply provide examples. Right? So if you think of machine translation, linguists have come up with rules of thumbs for a number of years and uh, we could debate to what extent this was successful about doing machine translation, but once um, people started using machine learning technique by simply providing examples of sentences in one language, sentences in the other language, then the computer can learn from this what are the rules to associate and essentially it learns to develop its own program, its own set of instructions about how to do the translation and, and then do it. So this is an example where you see we're we're, we're now moving to a meta level for the programming because you don't tell the computer directly what to do, but you simply um, tell it how to learn and then you feed it with some examples. And then in computer vision is the same problem. There, uh, people have tried for many years to come up with rules of thumbs about how to interpret an image, but what's more effective is just to provide examples, let the computer figure out what are the underlying rules, essentially it programs itself, and, and then this, this just works very well. Okay, so uh, here we could then speculate about singularity again and suggest that maybe uh, if we're going to have some runaway of technology, this could be if we have some self-evolving systems uh, that could leverage some form of machine learning, right? Because obviously there's not going to be a runaway of technology if, if humans have to come up with a solution for everything and program it, but now if the computer can do its own programming through machine learning and we just give it examples, then it might be able to do a lot more things than, uh, than otherwise. Okay, so now if we look at machine learning, there's lots of paradigms, perhaps by far uh, the paradigm that has been most effective in the industry is supervised learning. 
And here, what this means is that we provide the computer with examples of both inputs and outputs. So like if I want to do machine translation, I've got uh, sentences in one language, sentences in the other language, and then this is essentially telling the computer what's the desired output. So now just find the rules, and that's the predictor here. So it's going to find a way to map the inputs to the outputs, right? And it's supervised because the output is provided. So, so this is great, but now there's another form of machine learning that is much more um, uh, comprehensive and sophisticated and powerful, known as reinforcement learning, where in this case, what we do is we develop a system, and this system is going to execute some action. So this is our output that influences the environment, but then the environment will provide some feedback uh, so there's a feedback loop in the form of observations and, and rewards. And the idea is that then it can continue to improve itself gradually uh, based on, on that feedback. So here, nobody tells the computer what should be the output. Okay? Instead, there's just some reinforcements that help the computer um, figure out over time what to do. And here I would argue that as humans in our lives, most of the time, what, how we learn is not through supervised learning, but reinforcement learning. Because you, know, you, 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 you try something, and then you see if it works. And if it doesn't, then you try something else. And gradually, you can figure out a lot of things. Right? So here, this is something quite natural. And, and then with computers, then this can um, enable a, a form of self-evolution. Right, because supervised learning, uh, even though now, okay, it helps in terms of going away from just programming, you provide examples, but still it's static, right? The computer will only do the task that you provide examples for. But then with reinforcement learning, then the reinforcements can allow the computer to continue to improve, and, and then uh, the limits are much further in terms of what it can do. Okay, any questions so far regarding this? Yeah? Um, so for supervised learning, we have set examples, right? Which would basically tell the algorithm that this is right and this is wrong, and this is the path you have to take. But like, what is the deciding factor for reinforcement learning in that way? Like, what actually tells the system? Oh, okay, so here um, I've got uh, the notion of reward. I'll explain this with some examples in, in a moment. This notion of reward, think of it as like points, okay? or otherwise money, some scalar that tells you how good the actions are and the states of, of, of the system. And then here, we essentially give the computer the objective of maximizing those rewards. So, so it will try some actions uh, in a way that over time it will learn which ones lead to higher rewards. And, and then as long as those rewards really reflect what we want it to do, then it will learn to do the right thing. Any other questions? Okay. All right, so, oh, yeah. Uh, sorry, I just want to uh, know more about reinforcement in, in, in terms of image recognition. Uh, say, if you try to segment the image, uh, how do you know that how well this image is segmented by keeping whatever you refer to the Okay, yeah, that's a great question. I should say that in this talk, we're not going to use reinforcement learning for image segmentation, but the other way around. We're going to use image segmentation for reinforcement learning, okay? So, so yeah, um, and I guess it, it was explained at the beginning that yes, we can use reinforcement learning for segmentation. Um, I'm not actually familiar with that line of work myself, um, but generally speaking, um, the, I guess the issue is that, um, well, the, the, the most natural way of doing the segmentation would be to provide the ground truth with some labels where you tell the computer, here's the object that you, you need to segment. Um, but, um, well, I guess if we instead we want to use reinforcement learning with some rewards, um, I'm actually not sure. What's the, the best way of doing this? Okay. 
Uh, so in any case, just hold on. When I get to image segmentation and reinforcement learning, uh, hopefully things are going to be clear uh, what, what I'm talking about. But so far, I've just introduced reinforcement learning. Okay. Um, okay, so one great success of reinforcement learning has been Computer Go. Um, so if we go back in 2016, um, there was an important tournament between a computer program called AlphaGo that was written by researchers at uh, DeepMind and then uh, a world champion, Lee C. Dahl. And um, the computer actually won four games out of five. Uh, so in that sense, I mean, it was an unprecedented uh, success because before that, uh, computers used to be beaten by humans quite easily at, uh, at the game of Go. Now, what's really interesting is not just the fact that the computer won most of the games, but how it won. So AlphaGo was actually designed with two phases. There was a supervised learning phase where it was essentially just learning to imitate humans, in fact, imitate um, masters, human masters at Go. So basically, uh, somebody uh, just collected a large database of um, board configurations and what are the moves that um, a human expert would play and then the computer would simply try to uh, predict the moves that a human expert would play and, and that was a, a first pass at obtaining a reasonable program. But as you can imagine, if this is all the computer is going to do, imitate a grandmaster, of course you can learn to play reasonably well, but you're never going to surpass the best humans this way, right? So. Uh, if, if you want to really surpass, then you need to do something different and you cannot just do supervised learning, right? And so this is where reinforcement learning became key because then reinforcement learning allowed the computer to essentially play against itself and then use as a reward whenever it wins a game to essentially uh, train itself to um, develop some new strategies. And this became evident in game number two, move 37 in the tournament. In the tournament. So um, the computer, AlphaGo, placed a stone in a location that was actually very unexpected. So at the time, um, so this was a tournament in Korea, there were reporters, both Korean and English, that were analyzing this. And when AlphaGo played, um, everybody was scratching their heads and thinking, oh my god, AlphaGo just screwed up. This move is not a common move. No human expert, no master would play this. And then that, this was the immediate reaction. But then Lee Sidol was also scratching his head here. And everybody started thinking, what if the computer actually did a good move, a new move that nobody thought about? And it turned out that this was exactly what happened. So uh, you, you can watch um, some... Um, videos about um, the analysis of, of the game and so on and, and basically Lee Sidal took quite a long time to think about this and this ended up being a decisive move that got uh, AlphaGo to win this game and, and yeah so here uh, this was very interesting because then they did a post analysis and showed that the human odds that somebody would play this move was 1 in 10,000 right so a completely unexpected move that cannot happen with supervised learning so you need reinforcement learning for that okay so games computer go very interesting now what about the industry what what are some applications of reinforcement learning that could become um, uh, quite innovative so if we look at um, computer networks so at the moment um, all the telecom players are essentially rolling out 5G networks. And what, what does 5G really mean? It means that they're targeting um, a capacity, a bandwidth of 20 gigabytes per second, and then they're going to enable IoT. Okay, so this is nice. But now you might ask, what, what's going to happen after 5G? So naturally, okay, well, let's call it 6G. But what, what exactly is 6G? And, and here, I happen to collaborate with some companies in the telecom industry, and what they're actually starting to think right now is essentially how they could go from 
connectivity to intelligence, because it's one thing to connect the world with more bandwidth, but then what are we going to send through that network, and what's the purpose of all this, right? So, I mean, having all these Internet of Things uh, connected together is nice, but ultimately, it should do something useful, something smart, something intelligent, and, and this is where um, AI comes in, and in fact, um, a lot of them view reinforcement learning as the enabling technology for that. So essentially what they're working on are what they call self-diagnosing, self-managing, self-evolving networks. Um, okay, another example would be with respect to smartphones. Uh, so today when you buy a smartphone, you might think, um, okay, I'm, I'm interested in a phone that has a good battery life, it has lots of RAM, good camera quality, and, and, and so on. So mostly you see hardware properties. But then what about the next generation of phones? So a lot of those uh, phone manufacturers are in fact come, trying to come up with um, some intelligent uh, personal assistant. Um, and the idea is that the phone should adapt and, and learn how to serve you better, um, essentially become your best friend, your, 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 your best assistant. And, and then again, a lot of them are starting to think about using reinforcement learning for this. Okay, let me talk about one last application. So I work at Wireless AI. We're funded by Royal Bank of Canada. So we're in the world of financial services. So there, uh, historically, for financial services, there was no AI, no machine learning. Okay, so um, you can think of financial services as essentially the following. You've got assets, let's call that A, and, and then we're going to uh, maybe make a sale, make a trade, or essentially move those assets into something else that's called that B. So there's a transaction, and, and historically you would have some decision makers that would help in terms of coming up with the right decision to optimize uh, these types of transactions. Okay, so at the moment, um, now what the financial industry is going through is a data revolution in the sense that um, all those services now are being driven by data and the idea is that we, we're not relying only on human experts to make decisions but we're, we're now coming up with predictive models that will help make the best decision possible in terms of asset reallocation. Um, so this tends to rely mostly on supervised learning. But now going forward, where's the research? A lot of it is with respect now to reinforcement learning and the idea is that we want to develop personalized, adaptive, self-evolving services. And so again, we've got predictive models, but those predictive models, they're not static anymore. They evolve over time and then they improve and, and, and so on. This could be in the form of automated trading, or it could also be in the form of personalized uh, services for, for different customers. Okay, so hopefully I've uh, now motivated quite well um, the use cases for reinforcement learning. And you might say, well, are we there yet? You know, can we benefit from reinforcement learning and, and do all those things? And unfortunately, the answer is that, well, there's still some challenges. So reinforcement learning is right now a hot area of research. There's lots of um, hope for this. Uh, but then we, we still have a gap in, in terms of what, what we can do. So some of the challenges have to do with robustness, um, also explainability, and finally data efficiency. So today I'm going to talk about the last one, data efficiency. And in particular, uh, well, okay, so there's lots of solutions to make reinforcement learning more data efficient. But I'm going to talk about one specifically, uh, self-supervised learning. So I'll explain in more details what, what that means. Okay, so now moving into reinforcement learning, if we look again at the successes, we talked about Computer Go. Um, now many of the other successes are also in simulated environments like Atari, um, some robotic simulator, uh, various video games. And part of the reason for this is that if you want to design an agent, um, that learns how to play a game or how to actuate a robot or how to um, do something smart, 
then it needs a lot of feedback in, in the form of, of reinforcement in forms of, of rewards and, and then that takes time to accumulate, okay? So the beauty of simulated environments is that at some level we can generate an infinite amount of data and then we can learn and it doesn't matter if um, the algorithms are not efficient in terms of the amount of data. <coughs> Okay, but now if we want to deploy reinforcement learning in some of those industrial settings, then we need to make them more data efficient. Um, so in, in some situations, you know, there might be a user and then you want your system to interact with the user, but before it can make a good recommendation, you don't want to wait for hundreds of thousands of interactions. You know, people are, 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 are not patient, right? Like they want something to work on the first shot. So we've got a big gap here. Okay, so now in terms of quantifying the efficiency of reinforcement learning techniques, there was a paper written in 2017 where uh, there were several baselines that were compared. And what I'm showing here is a bunch of graphs where all of those graphs, if you look at the x-axis, okay, the x-axis is a number of frames. So that tells us the amount of data that's needed for the algorithm to play well at some Atari game. And this, x-axis goes from 0 to 40 million frames. So for a, a computer program, then to play Go, uh, sorry, to play Atari well, it needs 40 million frames, which is a huge amount of data. And in comparison, if you are asked to play an Atari game, then you will learn very quickly to come up with a reasonable policy um, after just a couple of trials. Okay, so, so then there is a gap and, and then we'd like to reduce this. Okay, so now let me explain at a very high level how reinforcement learning is typically done for um, computer games like Atari. So here I've got an image of a game. This is a Sequest and um, this is what we feed to the computer and here uh, this corresponds to a deep neural network, so think of it as essentially just taking the image's input and then it will decide what action to play in the game. So, um, so yeah, so it might be, you know, controlling um, something in, in, in the game that will uh, either kill some other monsters or earn some points and, 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 and so on. Okay, so, so then the problem um, of doing reinforcement learning here is essentially to train this deep neural network to make sense of those images and come up with the right actions. And to do this with reinforcement learning, then we use some rewards. And here I'm gonna claim that the rewards that we use for the training are sparse in the sense that at every frame, we essentially provide a number. Um, if it's just a game where um, the computer will either win or lose, then um, at every step, there's, there's essentially no feedback until the very end, and then at the end, it receives a bit, either zero or one, indicating whether it wins or it loses, okay? So in that sense, this is very s sparse because the computer has to play an entire game just to get one bit, and then this one bit then is used to train this, this deep neural network. Now, some other games, there are points, um, and then it can receive some feedback at every time step, but still, the idea is that it will get a number, um, so that's what I'm denoting here by a dot, just one number that is then used to train this deep neural network. Now in practice, these deep neural networks are actually quite big. They'll have millions of parameters, and now the question is, how much data, how many rewards does it need to train millions of parameters? And it turns out that the answer is, is not hard, uh, roughly speaking, if you have millions of parameters, you can expect that you will need millions of rewards. And that's exactly what we observed in the previous slide. So it takes 40 million frames to train um, a reasonable agent to play Atari. Okay, so, so yeah, so that kind of explains why it takes so long. Uh, so there's an imbalance between the number of parameters here and then the reward signal. Okay, so then the question is, what can we do to perhaps reduce the amount of reward, the amount of interaction that is needed? Um, so in this 
picture here. I've got again a picture for reinforcement learning where there's an agent that executes some action, it influences the environment, in this case the game, it receives a reward, but then there's another arrow here in the red, observation, where it gets to observe what is the frame, um, you know, the image of the game at every time step. And this captures a lot of information, right? Because um, this frame is millions of pixels, and there's a lot of information in there that perhaps could be leveraged to produce a new signal that could help to train uh, deep neural networks. So the idea of, of um, self-supervised learning is that now uh, we're not gonna train just based on the rewards, but perhaps we could train to maybe um, predict the observations that we're going to receive and then if this observation is a frame with millions of pixels, then we're gonna have a lot more information at our disposal and make the training faster. So, so generally speaking, self-supervised learning means that we're doing supervised learning, but we don't need to um, work hard in terms of obtaining the labels. So often this is the, the, the drawback about supervised learning, where will the labels come from? But then in a sequential task, like playing a game, and you observe images at every time step, you can take the next image and use it as like your target. So it serves as, as a label, but you don't have to work hard or to ask anybody to come up with the label. It's, it's just part of the game, right? It's part of your data. So in that sense, it's self-supervised because the computer can supervise itself to predict what it observes next, okay? So this is a new paradigm. Um, that essentially combines the best of supervised learning and unsupervised learning in a sense that it's supervised so it's easy, all the techniques we know will work well, but at the same time it's, it's unsupervised in, in the sense that nobody has to come up with the label so it's, it, it has the same cost as, as unsupervised learning. Okay, and any questions about this? Yeah. Oh, yeah, so, okay, if, if we get the computer to predict the next image, then we just wait the next for the next time step, then we receive that next image, and we can compare the two, and that tells us how good was our prediction. So, uh, the prediction image uh, from the current next step to the next next step is yeah. always, uh, it, it always leads to a good result, or a uh, higher well, I, I'm, I wouldn't claim that it always leads to a good result, but it's, it's, it's additional information that we can use for, for training, and I'll explain in a moment how, how to do that. Yeah. So it's learning the dynamics of the environment, um, but this is like orthogonal to whether it's model-based or model-free? Ah, very good point, yes. Yeah, so, so here we could say that um, whenever we have some additional tasks like this, uh, we might have a, a model-based approach because here, uh, if we can predict what the next frame is going to be, it means that we have a model of how the environment is going to evolve. Yes. Okay, so if we have an auxiliary task, then generally it means we have a model-based uh, Um No, I, I, okay, I, I, I wouldn't say that auxiliary tasks always imply model-based. Sometimes it does. Okay. Um, and in fact, again, the approach I'm going to explain um, it's not quite model based, so we're not going to use those predictions to build a model per se, but I'll, 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 I'll show how we can use that to just extract information in a much more structured, structured way. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so here, um, if I do a comparison between traditional deep reinforcement learning, so this is the uh, uh, the pipeline that we saw just earlier, and versus now reinforcement learning with self-supervised learning. Um, the main difference is that you see, when we learn, we don't learn just based on a sparse reward, but we can use a dense signal that would correspond to the next image, right? And then again, this next image contains millions of pixels, and now we have something that's balanced, right? We have a neural network that has millions of parameters, an image that has millions of pixels, and we're gonna see in a moment that we can train the neural network much faster 
in this fashion. Okay, so um, on this slide, um, I've got three games, Sequest, Space Invaders, Breakout. Turns out that beyond just doing self-supervised learning, we're going to see that it's not sufficient. There's, there's, there's some additional challenge if we want to get a reinforcement learning agent to perform well. And what's interesting is when we look at these games, if you've never seen those games, in fact, before I did this work with my students, um, I had never seen those games. I mean, Atari is even older than, than, than me, okay? So, so I, I didn't play Atari. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, you look at those games, and as a human, right, like all of us, we instantly know what's going on. So here's Sequest. Looks like there's a little submarine shooting some monsters, whatever, right? And, and we, we know what's going on in this screen, right? Here, Space Invaders, we can immediately guess that we've got our agent at the bottom in green, and then it's essentially shooting some monsters at the top, right? And then this game, Pong, there's a paddle, we, we have to hit the ball, we don't want to let the ball go down, right? And then when the ball hits the ceiling, then uh, we're gradually destroying the ceiling, right? So we immediately understand this. So, so what's interesting is you see humans can understand the game immediately. Like if you've never played this, right? You just look at it for a couple of seconds, you understand what's going on. And why I see you understand what's going on is that you, you understand the objects that are part of the game and also how they're moving. But for a computer to understand what's in this game, what are we feeding it? We're feeding it a sequence of pixels that's essentially a long vector of numbers. Now imagine if I asked you to play a video game, but instead of showing you the screen, I just showed you a big matrix of numbers and I said, play the game. You know, let's see how you're gonna do. Right, so <laughs> as you can imagine, the computer takes a long time to interpret those numbers, right? In our case, as humans, we look at the pictures, we know immediately what's going on, we understand what are the objects and how they're moving. The computer starts with numbers and it has to interpret those numbers and, and somehow come up with, with actions. So, so then, um, I guess the, what the computer is really doing, um, if I go back to, to the pipeline, is that this deep neural network when it receives an image, again, it really receives um, a long vector of numbers, and then we can think of this deep neural network as, as having two phases. There's, there's a, a, a prior phase where it's doing feature extraction, and then after that, once it has extracted useful information, then it, it comes up with a good action to play in, in the game. So this deep neural network is responsible of two things, right? understanding the image, extracting features, and then doing policy optimization to come up with good actions. Now for us as humans, we really just focus on the policy optimization. The, the feature extraction is already solved for us. Like we, we understand what, what we're looking at. And so this is another challenge when it comes to reinforcement learning, right? And another question is, what can we do to help the computer perhaps reason at a level that would be similar to humans where it could just focus on the policy as opposed to also doing the feature extraction. Okay, so I guess for humans, I, I said that when we look at those games, we, we see objects that are moving and we understand them. So then we could ask, well, could we use some form of computer vision to also automatically segment the moving objects and then feed that information to our reinforcement learning agent instead of just raw pixels, right? Because raw pixels, that's just a bunch of numbers, that's hard to interpret. But if you feed information about the objects and how they move, then it's high level information that you can start using to think about a policy, to strategize about the policy. Okay, so, so yeah, so the work that I'm gonna present now is precisely about how we can get a reinforcement learning agent to extract, um, well, to segment out those moving objects and then feed that to a reinforcement learning agent. Okay, any questions about the material I've covered so far? Good?
Okay, let's keep going. Okay, so the solution I'm going to propose, we, we call it morale for motion-oriented reinforcement learning. And then it will have two phases. So one phase that will do object segmentation. And here, in order for this to be practical, we need to do it in an unsupervised fashion. Right? Because if we do it supervised, where somebody has to come up with the labels that will tell the computer where are the objects and so on, then that's not going to be automated and, and that's not going to work, right? So it has to be unsupervised. Um, okay, so I'm going to show you how, how to do this. And then the beauty is that we're going to do this with only 1% of the frames that are used for training or reinforcement learning agents. So this phase is going to be really fast, okay? Just 1% of the frames. And then in the, during, those, uh, during this phase, our reinforcement learning agent is just going to execute random actions. And I'm going to claim that this is no big deal because at the very beginning, even if it was trying to do something smart, because it's really just trying to understand the images, it wouldn't be able to pick good actions anyway. So executing random actions is, is not a big deal, right? It's, it's just going to be for the 1%, first 1% of the frames. Then after that, uh, now it's going to know what are the objects, where they are, how they're moving, and, and so on. We're going to feed that to uh, uh, the reinforcement learning agent, and then it will learn to um, come up with a, a policy to play games much faster. Okay, so so I guess yeah, our, our first task in this first phase is to do this um, image segmentation, object segmentation, and and then again, um, if we were doing it in a supervised fashion, this would be quite labor intensive. And what I mean by um, segmentation. So if you take um, a scene like this, then perhaps you want to distinguish the pavement from the cars, from the buildings, uh, from poles, and, and so on. So you see here, red is essentially the segmentation of buildings, and then, um, well, we've got the segmentation of a pole here, and segmentation of the cars. So you see different objects are being uh, segmented out, right? And and yeah, doing this, like doing it in a supervised fashion means that somebody has to provide the label essentially which pixel belongs to which class, and that's labor intensive. It, it just doesn't scale. Okay, so it, it turns out that in computer vision, as was explained at the beginning, um, this, this is not anymore how people do this. Um, so you can leverage lots of unsupervised information. In particular, you can leverage an idea known as optical flow. So here, optical flow, essentially this idea that um, if you have a video sequence, then you can look at how pixels move from one frame to the next. And then their motion, uh, we're gonna call that the optical flow. And if you have, you see a scene where the background is static, but you've got some objects or people that are moving, and then you simply measure the motion of those pixels, and here you see this bicycle is all the pixels associated with the bicycle and the person on the bicycle are all moving in the same direction. So naturally, we can guess that that's got to be an object. That's got to be something that we can segment out. And then same thing for people uh, here that are walking. So their pixels are all moving more or less in the same direction, so same optical flow. And, and then we can guess that these must be objects and we can, we can already have a rough idea of, of where they are for, for the segmentation. Uh, another example here uh, with somebody playing tennis and, and so on. Yes? Um, so how do you use uh, leverage optical for differentiation between like let's say pavements and buildings because they will not move at all, right? Ah, yes, good point. So okay, here I cannot use optical flow to distinguish things that are not moving. So like in, at the top here, we are segmenting out different types of objects, and maybe only the cars are moving, so the rest we would not be able to segment them out. Um, so yeah, so that uh, cannot be done uh, easily, at least not with what I'm going to explain. But um, in this work, uh, I'm going to come back to Atari games, and I'm going to claim that in games, what tends to matter are the moving objects. Okay, so the static background most of the time is not so important, is the moving objects, and therefore um, it'll be great 
if, if, if I can just segment those out. Yeah? Yes, so I'll explain in a moment how the background could be moving, and in fact the camera itself could be moving, and, and then uh, the idea is that if the background of the camera is moving, and essentially all the background is moving in the same direction, that that's one optical flow, and, and then it just means that, okay, the flow is not zero, but it's the same flow, it's a constant flow, so we can still pick that up. Yeah. Ah, yeah, okay. If, if there are multiple things that are moving at the same rate, um, then now that's going to be difficult, so I guess we won't have enough information to uh, separate them. So there, there are other ways as well to segment uh, things out. So I mean, if, if uh, the moving objects are, are not overlapping, then that might already be a clue. Or if you're in 3D, then you can often use depth information to tell that these might be different objects. Okay, so um, there, there's all, there was some work um, done um, around 2017 uh, in fact, here what I'm showing you is a deep neural network called Structure from Motion Network, so SFMNet. And, and this network was designed by some researchers at Google um, precisely to segment out um, some objects that are moving in an unsupervised fashion. So the way this network works is that we feed in um, a pair of frames and okay, there's, there's a top part and then there's also a bottom part to the network. For the top part, uh, the network is essentially responsible of extracting some information to guess what is the camera motion as well as the motion of every object that is moving in, in the scene and then eventually compute the optical flow. The bottom part of the network is used mostly to capture depth information. So for a 3D scene, then um, the point is that the flow that will be um, observed for the pixels changes or depends on the depth of those pixels. So you also need to um, extract information about the, the depth, how far are those objects, because then you see the motion of the same motion for an object that is near versus far will look different in, in the video sequence. Okay? So, so we need depth information for that. And in any case, this entire network, the main purpose is to compute the flow. And the flow again is, is the motion, uh, the change um, of, of the pixels from one frame to the next. So if you can compute the flow, add this to your first frame, then you get a prediction about what the next frame is going to be, and then you can wait and see what your next frame is. That's your ground truth. Compare that to your predicted next frame, and then you've got now an error measure that you can use to backpropagate through the network and train your network. Okay, so, so that's the intuition here. Yeah. So just in terms of like the representation of flow, is that like a um, like a vector at every point in the image or something? Or like how is that actually represented? Um, yeah, that's a good point. So uh, I guess there are many ways in which we could represent this. This is a, a natural way. So let's have um, essentially a vector for every pixel indicating its motion. Yeah. Um, another way um, would be to, let's say that you um, capture um, the camera motion and also the object motion. So it would be to have a single vector per object and also for the camera. And then in this work is the second approach that we're going to use. So, so we're not going to have a vector per pixel, but simply one per object. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so yeah, so to summarize, the, the beauty of this network is that it allows us to learn or to train um, uh, a network to segment objects in a completely unsupervised fashion simply by um, predicting what the flow is and then applying it to one frame to get the next frame 
and then compare that to the ground truth for the next frame, and then use the difference to essentially backpropagate through the network. And when I say backpropagate, that means essentially computing a gradient based on the error, and then adjusting all of the parameters based on, on this gradient. Any other questions regarding this network? Good? OK. All right, so um, SFMNet um, was applied to the KIDI data set. So this is an interesting data set that has um, uh, scenes of um, cars that are going through some intersection. And there, um, there's a lot of interest for smart cities where you want to estimate traffic and even control the lights um, to simply recognize cars, bicycles, pedestrians, and so on. And these are all moving objects, right? So, so here we've got um, the predicted motion mask. So here a motion mask is essentially um, a segmentation, if you want, for each object with uh, its motion. Okay, so you've got in, in blue, essentially, the things that are moving that have been recognized. And then you can compare to the ground truth here. Uh, now, if you want to know what's the flow um, that's been predicted, so this is what this column represents, and this is the ground truth, where the color essentially just indicates um, a direction for uh, the motion. Okay. So in general, this worked reasonably well. At least uh, the top examples were quite good. It's just the last two that uh, the results are, are obviously problematic. Okay, so, so this approach is not perfect, okay, but it works reasonably well. And here, I guess when I see reasonably well, we're going to use it in reinforcement learning to essentially get the computer to understand where the objects are and what their motion is. But if you think about it, if the goal is not so much to output a perfect segmentation, but just to get a sense of where are the moving objects in a game, then the segmentation doesn't have to be perfect. It's a bit like if you're driving a car, and you need to obviously understand where are the obstacles, where are the other cars, well, even as a human, right, you can tell the precise distance between the car and every object, you just have a rough idea. And then, so here is the same thing, when we get our segmentation, I'm not looking for a perfect segmentation. Obviously, there are other techniques that are much better than that in terms of getting the edges you know, much more crisp and, 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 and accurate than that. But it will be good enough to feed to a reinforcement learning agent. OK, so in our case, because we want to apply this to Atari games, Atari games, in fact, are simply 2D environments. Um, so if you look at, at the games um, that I showed earlier, right, then they're, they're just simple graphics, only 2D. So we essentially simplified SFMNet to work just with 2D information. So that means we kept only the top part of SFMNet and we got rid of the bottom part that was computing depth information because depth information is only relevant when you're in 3D. In 2D, we don't need that. So essentially, our network starts with two frames as input. It does a bunch of convolution to extract some information. Then from this, it will compute object and camera translation. So this is their, their motion. And then it will also compute masks. So that's the segmentation. Where are those objects? And then combine that to get an estimate of the optical flow. OK. so. Um, in terms of doing this network, we did a bunch of modification beyond just simplifying it to 2D. We removed the skip connections. Um, we changed the loss function. We also did some regularization, and we did some core cloud learning. Okay, so uh, so this is where we get in the art of deep learning. Okay, so um, I wish it was a rigorous science, but at this point. I must say that there's a lot of art to it, okay? So, and this is where the ingenuity of the students who did this uh, was quite important. Um, so, okay, briefly, uh, what I mean by no skip connection, if I go back to this network, you'll see that I've got some connections here um, that are essentially skipping some layers. And this is something quite common that uh, is done often in, in um, various architectures. And the idea is that this way, the network 
doesn't have to necessarily remember all the information that it needs as, as it goes through different layers. It can go back and look up some of that information from the start. The trouble with doing this is that in our case, we would like to extract information that then tells us about the object mask as well as their translation. And if we have some skip connection, then the network could cheat in the sense of, you know, not being able to really compute this and then just look back and, and, and try to, to get that information uh, this way. And, and then so it wouldn't help us afterwards for reinforcement learning. So that's the main idea for this. Um, the second one for reconstruction loss. So when you train to predict the next frame, then the natural thing is just to compare your predicted frame to the ground truth by, let's say, just measuring Euclidean distance between pixel intensities. The trouble with doing this is that um, you can have two frames that look similar, but then their pixel intensities could could differ quite a bit because maybe some pixels are just shifted a little bit, right? And then it will give you a huge error. And, and when you look at it with your human eyes, then you don't see much of a difference. So, so then Euclidean distance is actually a bad loss function for training in, in computer vision. So here we use another thing called structural dissimilarity that is closer to a loss function that reflects uh, how we humans perceive two images. Okay, um, the third thing about <coughs> flow regularization. So here, when we segment out objects, we'd like to make sure that we get the, uh, a segmentation that only includes the objects themselves and not anything extraneous. So, so here, this L1 loss is essentially just something to get um, a segmentation that's going to be as small as possible. Okay, and then lastly, curriculum learning. This is just a, a technique where when we do the training, instead of uh, training mostly to reconstruct the second frame, we do it uh, by introducing some regularization and then removing that gradually. Okay, so, so the regularization at some level is not really needed. No, sorry, I guess it's the other way around. So I guess, yeah. Here I want the regularization, actually I, I don't want any regularization at the beginning, and then I increase that gradually, so that my weight here goes from zero to one, okay? So, so yeah, so the idea is that you make the task simpler, <coughs> you train the network, and then gradually you make it harder and harder by saying, okay, find the object, I don't care if your object mass are, are um, very tight, and then with the L1 loss function, then we can, force it to make these object mass tighter and more accurate. Okay, so, so we do that gradually. Yeah? Uh, in the SFM network, did they also use uh, the structural dissimilarity as a reconstruction loss? They did not. Okay, so they use L2 in? Um, okay, I don't remember exactly okay, what yeah. they did. Um, that's probably L2, yeah. Uh, but yeah, we changed that to oh. using uh, structural dissimilarity. It just seems to me like uh, everyone should be using structural dissimilarity. Yes, and in fact, yeah, that's a concept that's been around for a long time. Um, so it dates back uh, more than 15 years. Um, but yeah, that's something to keep in mind that yeah, for most app, um, uh, computer vision tasks, that that's a good loss function to work with. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, so here, uh, because we're doing this in the context of Atari games that are 2D simpler graphics, then we figured let's just use a simpler network uh, because then it will train faster, we can debug it more easily, and, and, and so on. And in fact, now what would be interesting is to go back to uh, the original SFM net in 3D and apply this to perhaps um, 3D games um, uh, and, and also all maybe um, other tasks uh, like traffic control uh, that are in the real world. <coughs> oh.
Okay, so um, on this slide, I'm showing you what happens with our network when we apply it to uh, some of those games. So again, the input consists of two frames. So I've got an example here for the game of Breakout and the game of Pawn. So Breakout, again, is this game where there's a paddle, and then you hit the ball, and then the idea is that you want to destroy the ceiling at the top. Okay. So here, um, we can see in, in this column uh, the sum of all the mass, so essentially all the objects that it recognized in green. Okay, so it recognized the, the paddle and the ball correctly. And, and here we've got the most important object, so that's the paddle, and then the optical flow, so this is color coded, so red means that the ball is moving in some direction, green means that the, ball, the, the paddle is moving in a different direction. And you'll notice that you see the object mass are far from perfect, okay, but still they give us the right location and, and also the right motion, and that's going to be sufficient for our purposes. Pong is similar, we've got two players, each have a, a paddle, they, they hit the ball, and then that's what gets recognized here. Um, I've got three more games here, so Sequest, uh, Space Invaders, and Beam Rider, where it's recognizing um, the submarine as well as some of the monsters. Uh, here it's recognizing all of the monsters and our little agent. Beam Rider is a, an interesting game because um, in this game, there's some visual artifact. So if you play this game, um, what happens is that you've got some lines that are the beams that are just moving down the screen, but those beams that are moving down, they're completely irrelevant. So here, um, our technique does what it's supposed to do. It recognizes things that are moving, so it picks up those moving beams, but they turn out to be useless, okay? So we're going to see in a moment that this will inject useless information to our reinforcement learning agent, and that's going to hurt it. Okay. Um, what it should have done is to uh, pick out the agent, which is at the bottom, as well as um, um, their arm missiles and uh, other little agents, but they're much smaller, and they don't get picked up here. So this, this is going to be a game where the, the um, technique doesn't work well. Any questions regarding this? Good. Okay. All right, so now we're gonna combine the technique for doing the segmentation with reinforcement learning. And what I've done is if you look at this network, it's essentially the same as what we had before where I add this bottom part here. So here the top part is essentially just a, a summary of what I have here. So I have some frames, do some convolutions, extract object mass, and optical flow. Okay. So in this network here, same idea, I do some convolutions, and then I produce the optical flow. But now what I'm going to do is add a, a bottom layer, or um, yeah, bottom part, that corresponds to a reinforcement learning agent, and here, there's lots of architectures that one can use for reinforcement learning, but um, what I'm depicting here is, is just a very basic actor critique that would uh, do some convolutions to extract information from an image and then feed that to an actor that would select actions and also to a critique that would evaluate how good those actions are. Okay. So most of the techniques for reinforcement learning essentially fit um, with this diagram here. And in fact, our approach can be combined with any deep reinforcement learning technique. So, so here, the key thing is that you see the top part is segmenting objects, and then we've got this arrow here that takes the information for the segmentation and feeds it by concatenating it um, with uh, what the, uh, a, a classic reinforcement learning <coughs> agent would, would do in terms of uh, processing a frame, and then uh, would use both essentially the high level object information coming from the top, and then the low level information coming from the raw pixels. So that's the idea, okay? So essentially just 
um, added more information that we feed to the reinforcement learning agent in terms of high level object information. Now, if you look carefully, it would be tempting to uh, put an arc that would go from the segmentation down to the reinforcement learning agent. What we did instead is we took uh, um, an intermediate layer, so this is a fully connected layer of size 512, and fed that instead. And this is where, again, it's an art more than a science. Okay, Initially, the students um, were feeding in the object mass directly, because the object mass contained the right information with the translation. They were feeding this to the reinforcement learning technique, but it wasn't working very well. Then they said, well, what if we feed something a little earlier, uh, some type of embedding? OK, so, so this vector of size 512 is essentially an embedding that must contain all the information about the object mass, because you see everything that comes here in terms of object mass and optical flow goes through this layer. So this layer must contain that information. It's just that this information is in a different format. And then it worked out better. So here you might ask, why? And the answer is, well, we're not entirely sure. Uh, there's lots of anecdotes uh, out there from other people who had similar experiences. Often, if you can just get an embedding for some uh, valuable information, that works out better. And my speculation is this has to do with how the optimization is working. So at the moment, the reality is that in deep learning, the way we do the optimization is that we have a, a network, and then at the very end of the network, we have a loss function, compute the gradient, and then use this gradient to essentially do some small updates for all of the weights. Right? So this is the back propagation through the network. But we're essentially doing gradient descent. If any of you are familiar with optimization, gradient descent is essentially the most basic type of optimization technique. And here it's not like people in deep learning don't know better. It's, it turns out that the more sophisticated technique for optimization either don't scale or don't generalize. So somehow, um, I guess this simple gradient-based technique is still more or less a state of the art. But we know that it has weaknesses in the sense that if um, there's several local optima, it might get stuck somewhere, okay? And that's our hypothesis here, that essentially we're using a very simple optimization technique, and, uh, and it's, you know, if we had better optimization, we should be able to just feed in um, the uh, object mass directly, but it just turns out that feeding in and embedding instead helps the optimization, okay? So that's, that's our understanding. Okay, any questions regarding this? Good? Okay. All right, so we um, applied this by combining, you see, our object segmentation technique with an actor critique, and here we, we combined it with two popular baselines that are coming from OpenAI. One of them is called A2C, another one is called PPO. I'm not gonna go into the details of those techniques, but they're standard reinforcement learning techniques, okay? And if we combine our technique with A2C and compare it to just plain A2C, and we do better on 26 games, roughly the same on 30 games, and worse on three games. So there's a, essentially 59 games out there that you can use uh, for, for testing. We tried them all, and these are the results that we got. Okay, so the approach doesn't always work better, but it tends to work better most of the time. Okay? And same thing with PPO. Yeah. Uh, when you say you're maximizing the rewards, um, like, are you doing that like in the kind of like two one sense of like minimizing the error between the like, action, like the estimate of the reward and the actual reward? I, okay, so those techniques, A2C and PPO, are, are not Q learning per se. Um, so, so then they're optimizing something different. But otherwise, generally speaking, yes, that's the idea. So at the yeah, end of the I day, feel like with the, with your network, like in terms of multiple objectives, just with that, like the reward. One. Right. So I guess yeah. Here we we maximize the reward. So this actor critique 
um, will receive rewards from the environment. And, and then so I guess the, the, the bottom part is trained based on the sparse reward signal. Um, but then the top part is essentially based on the dense signal of the next frame uh, for, for the optimization. Right, so yeah, the top and the bottom are trained with different loss function. So the top part is trained to minimize the optical flow error, and then the bottom part is trained to maximize rewards. Ah, uh, yeah, good, good point. So um, we, is, we actually do train the top part first for 1% of the frames, until it, it actually is able to recognize objects reasonably well. And then after that, then we start training the bottom part, but we keep on training the top part as well. Okay, so here are some videos that illustrate how the approach works. So you've got on the left-hand side, um, just the regular screen when somebody plays pump, okay? On the right hand side, you've got the object masks that are recognized in real time by the top part of our network. And then obviously the uh, choice to, uh, uh, the choice of action is also reflected here um, based on what the bottom part of the network is, is choosing. Okay, so, so then the beauty is that you can see that um, here, at least for this game, it is recognizing the objects quite well and it is able to play the game quite well, okay? Uh, same thing for this one, um, same thing for Sequest, but then for the last one here, Beam Rider, so as I explained, it is recognizing the beams, so it's doing what it's supposed to do, but unfortunately that's the wrong thing, okay? So you see, uh, we've got our agent right here, but if you look carefully, there are like these little missiles sometimes that come down or, the, or bullets that it shoots but then you see they're so small compared to the beams that it doesn't recognize them and then once in a while the whole screen is flashing and then it just gets thrown off by that too okay so so yeah so this is a game where it's not performing very well okay any questions regarding the videos You said you train the top of your network um, for the first one percent of all the frames. Mm -hmm. um, in, in the bottom, uh, during during that training phase, do you um, freeze the bottom part, or do you also train it jointly? No. So during the is one percent, yeah. the bottom part is frozen, oh, okay. and in fact, we just haven't started training anything right. for the bottom part. But, but does it really matter? Like, could, have you tried also just training it jointly for the top first one percent? Um. Right, so if we train jointly from the beginning, the problem is, you see we've got this link. Um, so it will propagate some really noisy information that will disturb the top part. Right, okay. But, oh yeah, I guess you could like disable that link for <laughs> the first 1% of the frames and then being able to like... Yeah, that, that, that's true, yeah, we could do that. Things, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so here I've got some curves that illustrate the performance. So again, we've got for the x-axis, the number of frames. Now you'll notice that in, in our graphs here, we go up to 10 millions. So it's an improvement compared to 40 millions already. And now we compare several approaches. Our approach is the one in yellow. Okay, so it's this curve here. And the goal is to maximize reward. So we want curves that are as high as possible. Okay. So, yeah, so this is our approach. And then we've got uh, several variants of our approach um, that um, don't perform as well. Okay. And it's only in Beam Rider that you see our approach just doesn't do anything better than the other approaches. In fact, it gets beaten by some of the bases. Okay, so yeah, these are graphs for four of the games. We did that for all 59 games. In fact, if you go on my website, there's a link where you can see both videos and also graphs for all 59 games.
Okay, we also did an ablation study, which means that often when you do modifications to an algorithm, it might not be clear what is really responsible for the success. And so an ablation study, the idea is that you take all of your changes and you remove them one by one to show the difference that, that happens. So we've got our full technique, which is in blue here, and each one of these other curves is when we remove one of the things that we did to change SFMNet. So if you remember, we did curriculum learning, L1 loss regularization, and, and so on. And then this, this is what's uh, reflected here. If we don't do those changes, then the results get worse. So it means that all those changes were indeed impactful. <coughs> okay. Yeah. Ah, good question, yeah. So we, okay, we haven't tried it on Mujoko. Um, so I, I guess Mujoko, the default setting, you feed essentially measurements of um, uh, different articulators, um, so you don't feed in an image. Now, I'm sure by now there are versions of that that would essentially have a, a visual Mujoko where you would feed in an image and, and then um, I guess you could get it to recognize um, the motion of, of, of itself, right? Because it's, it's the robot itself that's in, in the image and then it, uh, it might be able to work. So yeah, so this, this would be quite interesting to try. At, at least in theory, yes. So yeah, if you've got a sequence of observations, then um, yeah, you should be able to uh, extract the motion. But I mean, at some level, this, this is something quite challenging, and this is, this is what SFMNet gives us, right? Um, yeah. Okay, so you're asking between yeah, transfer, which is purple, and which one? And the yellow one. S say that again? The yellow one. The yellow one, okay. Um, right, okay, so yeah, the yellow one joint means that we do the, um, uh, the training uh, after 1% frames, right? Then we do the training simultaneously for based on rewards and also the prediction on the next frame. So we train everything together. And then transfer, the idea is that um, we simply um, train the top part and then stop and then essentially allow information to, to transfer down to the bottom part of the network. Yeah. The joint one trains everything. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna stop here and conclude. Um, so what I've done is essentially introduce uh, this technique, MORALF, so for motion-oriented reinforcement learning. And then um, hopefully by now you've understood that uh, the, the crux of the idea is that now we can get a computer to not just work at the level of raw pixels, but to essentially recognize higher level object information, right? And then that allows it to then do the planning for reinforcement learning based on this higher level information faster. Um, okay, some of the advantages of this is that obviously, okay, we do the optimization faster, but another byproduct of this is that we also gain in terms of interpretability because you saw from the videos that you can actually see what it recognizes. If it doesn't recognize the right thing, that's a, that's a clue already that it's not gonna perform well and that explains why. You see, like with Beam Rider, we can understand what it's doing based on that. Um, okay, now in terms of future work, so the obvious thing to try is to do the same thing in 3D environments. 
So if some of you are interested, this could be a good challenge. So <coughs> there's lots of video games um, that are just with more realistic graphics than Atari and also uh, 3D graphics. And then so it would be a natural extension to try that for, for 3D environments. Um, also, I put here object-oriented reinforcement learning. So there is a literature that goes back at least 10 years where um, already researchers had this idea that it would be neat to do reinforcement learning at the level of objects. The trouble is that up until this work, nobody had a way of extracting the object information. What everyone was doing was essentially just saying, okay, it's hypothesized that we have a way of getting the object, and then they would cheat, they would just, you know, get some information from a simulator or something that would just tell them where the objects are and then do the planning based on that. So, so now we've essentially filled in that gap so we can make object-oriented reinforcement learning practical and, and now there's a lot more that could be done based on that and in particular coming up with a physics-based model that could leverage the fact that we're predicting the next frame and, and so on. Um, okay, now, if you're not too excited about doing this with video games, although most people do like video games, you might say, okay, what about something useful in life, something real world, right? So, um, it would be interesting, in fact, to try this for unsupervised vehicle tracking and, and traffic control. So, here I talked to um, several researchers, in some cases at various companies, that are doing work with smart cities to uh, recognize um, uh, traffic at some intersections. And one of the problems that they have is that for every intersection, they typically have to go through a phase of, of training where they collect data uh, with a video camera that's installed at this intersection. And, and then the problem is then they have to label some of that data, do the training, and then eventually deploy. But, but then uh, this could uh, allow them to do it in an unsupervised fashion. And then you could have a layer of reinforcement learning on top that could do the traffic control. So it, it would be, at least in theory, possible to apply this work for smart cities. OK. Um, yeah, so the, this is what I wanted to talk about. And then, um, yeah, if anybody's interested for the details, this, this is the paper. And again, the two students, uh, Vic and Jameson, uh, were undergrads. And then you can do the same thing if you want. OK. <laughs> Let me say one more thing. If some of you are also interested in graduate studies, I'm also always looking for uh, you know, smart minds and, and so on. So feel free to talk to me about that. Well, on behalf of UT Best and everyone here today, we'd like to thank you for taking the time uh, to come. We have this for you as well. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. I have a general question about like the uh, the um, approach of doing it like flow information. Do you have any theories as to why it um, or, or, like why it's better than getting it to predict like the static image of the next frame? Like why does that improve the performance of the system? Like using like getting it to predict the flow information instead of getting it to just predict the next frame as a whole. Okay, so I, I yeah I guess here as long as it can predict the next frame, yeah. then we're good. So here um, this part of the network was going through the step of first computing the flow and then the idea is that we can simply add the flow with the first frame to get a prediction for the next one. If you've got a different way of predicting the next frame, then I think this this would work too. Yeah. So here the, the key is we just want some architecture that computes as intermediate layers the mask and the motion, because that's what we're interested in. And then after that, we'll compute something else that we can verify, like the next one. Right. Okay. And uh, I just had another question, which was in the like slide where you had like your um, architecture, it had like the two outputs on the bottom of which was like actor and critic. So what's the like critic? The oh, what, what does the critique do? Yeah. Yeah, so, so the critique is typically computing a value function. 
a bit like in, in DQN, so um, often some, some sort of uh, Q network that evaluates or critiques how good are the actions of the network. So the idea is that, yeah, the critique is evaluating, so it's a value function. The actor is computing a policy, so it's computing actions that are going to be executed. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, thanks. So was the baseline uh, ATC just the bottom of that network? So I, if the baseline is... Uh, so the baseline that you compared against, like um, ATC, yeah. uh, was that just the bottom part of, the, of your architecture? Uh, yes, so... Or, yeah, I'm just wondering yeah. about like number of parameters, um, what do you control for that? Um, right, so, so here, A2C was essentially this part, the actor critique, so the, 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 the first part here is just a regular convolutional yeah. neural network. Yeah. Um, so, so A to C would oh, be just the end, okay. the end here. Okay. And then it doesn't have to be A to C, we also did PPO. Yeah. Um, and you could plug in anything you want. Okay. Um, but when you compare it against another baseline, like without this architecture, um, do you compare like similar number of parameters? Or, uh, yeah. Right, well, so, so you see here that these comparisons we're always like PPO alone versus PPO with all of this in front. Oh, okay. 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 So then, I yeah. guess in terms of parameters, we have more parameters. Yeah. Uh, but then the point is, we use that to essentially get higher level information. Yeah. Okay. Um. Okay, so, so yeah, so here, what this shows is that the actor and the critique, yes, they're sharing um, how to extract information from the frames, and then after that, like, the actor is computing an action, the critique is computing a value, so yeah, so they have a, a, a shared initial part. And I guess you could have an actor critique that has nothing shared, but it is common to do that. Yes, because usually you see the information that is used to compute an action might be quite related to the information that's needed to evaluate that action. Right? So, so that's why it makes sense that at least the, the bottom layers could be shared. Um, would this slide be uploaded? So I shared them with the organizers. Um, yeah, we, all, we can upload them to the Facebook. Yeah, so here, these are uh, vectors, and because we're just in 2D, so the, um, uh, the motion is essentially just a translation, so it'd be just a vector of um, size two, um, and then we have one such vector per object. Yeah, so the idea is that, yeah, we, we say that uh, a group of object, uh, sorry, a group of pixels with the same flow the same motion must be an object. Ah, yeah, so here we just started with an upper bound 20 objects max, so that means 20 different groups of pixels that could have different motion. And for a Terry, that's more than enough. Now, in fact, um, if we look at, you see this game, Space Invaders, we have many um, different monsters, but what's interesting is that they all move in a synchronized fashion, and then our approach, in fact, tends to recognize them all as the same object. Yeah. So we did not enforce any notion of continuity, so the pixels could be in different locations, but if they have the same motion, that's one object. Okay, well, thank you very much, and uh, yeah, I can uh, chat more and any topic you guys want.